Hill in northwestern Oklahoma um, are close to a mile high. Um, the highlands in the east are also um, relatively high, and we have a lot of relief in the east. And, and what we call the, uh, it, a lot of people will pronounce this the Awashita Mountains, but it's just pronounced the Washita Mountains, just exactly like the Washita River. Uh, of course, this is, we occupy uh, the southwestern low of the Ozark uh, Plateau. Uh, one of the oldest mountain ranges in the world uh, are the Arbuckle Mountains, which are, are highly eroded. And we have some granite mountains, uh, also highly eroded, uh, the Wichita Mountains in the southwest. And I'm only pointing out these things because there are some uh, connections between the barn uh, materials and, and patterns uh, and these areas, particularly uh, materials with the Wichita Mountains uh, and log construction with all the rest. Uh, the Arbuckles are not an agricultural area. They're um, mostly a grazing area, uh, much like Osage County up here in the north. If you're familiar with uh, uh, the pioneer woman, Ree Drummond, uh, she's always talking about Osage County and that Osage County is mostly ranching country because of uh, the presence of so many rocks and stones. So you don't, see, you don't see a lot of barns there. You see a lot of barns in the agricultural area. The agricultural areas uh, are, are most uh, concentrated, or at least the, the wheat production uh, zone is most concentrated here. And so in terms of the barn size, this is where you find the largest barns in the, in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, large, some people are interested in large barns, some people are interested in log barns, some people are interested in pretty red barns, but I'll show you a bunch of those. Uh, in terms of precipitation, uh, Oklahoma is also highly varied between the southeast with about 54, uh, 54 inches of precipitation annually. Uh, this year, like twice that almost. And in the uh, far west, in the panhandle, Cimarron County, uh, you're approaching uh, 14 inches uh, annually per, uh, per year, and they haven't had that in a while. At the time I was doing the survey, most of the state was under a horrible, horrible drought. And uh, that had sort of interesting, uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, bearings on, uh, on how I got things done, but uh, actually it was quite a help in some ways, but I'll move on. In terms of the uh, vegetation, Oklahoma's vegetation is a, uh, a mosaic of it's sort of the transition between the Eastern hardwood forest, which we find in uh, the, uh, the forests of the Ozarks and the transitional forests of the, of the piney woods of, of the American South, as you find down here in the Washita Mountains. But the most, uh, most uh, uh, probably common uh, area of woodland is the cross timbers. Cross timbers region is an area that runs from a little part of Southeast Kansas through the middle of Oklahoma and through the middle of Texas all the way to basically the, um, the San Antonio. Now this, uh, this region is, is a, uh, an area that uh, where agriculture is, is a mix and a transition from, from grazing to, uh, uh, to originally cotton farming and now wheat farming, somewhat, somewhat wheat farming. And then we have the, the, the true grasslands beyond about Interstate 35, which runs right about through here. So Interstate 35 or the uh, 97th Meridian, more or less, is a transition zone in Oklahoma between the true grasslands, which are very rare now in uh, Western Oklahoma, uh, and, uh, and the forested, mostly forested areas. One big threat to barns is uh, one of the major uh, hazards of the state of Oklahoma, and that's tornadoes, of course. Um, uh, there are, and I, I should also mention other hazards like fires. I don't have really time to get into all this, but um, fires and uh, strong winds and tornadoes have uh, taken out many, many uh, barns in the state. And even while I was doing the survey over the course of five years, I ran across probably a dozen or so different barns that I had surveyed and then found that they were gone after um, after a year or two of revisiting a site. So um, it's just incredible how much attrition there is with regard to old barns. Historically and culturally, Oklahoma, of course, was uh, Indian Territory. And then after 1890, um, <clears throat> Indian Territory was uh, divided up into uh, the 
eastern half of the state of Oklahoma, which remained known as Indian Territory or un unorganized territory, meaning it didn't have a uh, uh, didn't have a formal territorial legislature and government. Oklahoma Territory was created, and it had a territorial legislature. Um, and in 1890, the former neutral strip, otherwise known as no man's land, um, was added to Oklahoma in the Oklahoma Organic Act, and that uh, became known as Old Beaver County, and eventually it became divided up in, uh, into three counties. The Panhandle is one of the most interesting areas of the state of Oklahoma, in my, uh, in my opinion, uh, and we'll see some examples from, um, from that area. This is a historical map to show you sort of the, some, some things uh, that you should know about <clears throat> Indian Territory and Oklahoma Territory. Indian Territory, of course, has been occupied by uh, agriculturally oriented, market oriented settlers, farm settlers since 1830, and in some cases even earlier than that. So <clears throat> Indian Territory, the eastern half of Oklahoma was largely settled about the same time as the state of Texas was, uh, a little later, but uh, people were filing into Indian Territory from the, from the upland south and the lower south. And we know this as, uh, you know, you know this area as the land of the five civilized tribes. The five civilized tribes, you know, that's not, a, that's not intended to be a derogatory term. Uh, what that means is that these people um, who arrived some 190 years ago had been living among um, uh, white settlers, interacting with white settlers, living as white settlers uh, when they were forcibly removed in the 1830s. Uh, they had developed or they had acculturated and picked up Southern and Upland Southern culture uh, for at least 150 years prior to that. So beginning in the, in the mid to maybe early 1700s, the, uh, the, the five tribes had become uh, just another component of the, uh, an interesting component of the Upland South and the backwoods frontier uh, folk culture that we all know. So I'm going to speed past the, um, the history here. Um, Oklahoma Territory was a little bit different. Uh, it was land taken from the five tribes after the Civil War because the five tribes sided with the, unit, with the Union. Uh, the United States opened it up mostly through um, because of popular sentiment out of Kansas. Uh, in, 18, uh, in the 1880s, of course, the, uh, the Homestead Act was, uh, was not assigning much good land to anybody. And most of the best lands were taken up except for those in present day Oklahoma. So eventually uh, the federal government caved and uh, allowed settlement uh, to uh, proceed into this area, mostly through land runs. And so you're familiar with the Oklahoma land runs, which occurred from about 1889 to 1893, 1894. Um, and those, were, those land runs, of course, made the territory of Oklahoma uh, instantly populated. It also brought people from all over the uh, United States. Uh, there were not only uh, Midwesterners coming into this area of, of the state, and Midwesterners were favored because of their Union uh, history. Their, the Union uh, veterans, in fact, were, were uh, tended to be quite favored in terms of uh, getting into, uh, in, into this part of the state. Um, on the, uh, so, so we have people from the Ohio Valley, from uh, particularly Indiana, uh, Illinois, Missouri. Um, there are also people who migrated from areas that had previously been settled where they have not had a lot of success, uh, as in parts of Minnesota uh, and, and the, the Dakotas and Nebraska. And we have not only those um, sort of national homeborn uh, migrants, uh, we also have a lot of uh, European migrants and, and not necessarily directly from places like uh, you know, the Czech or well, former Czechoslovakia, Czechoslovakia or the German speaking lands of Central Europe. But we also have people from, <clears throat> from the United States, particularly places like Nebraska and Missouri, who were first and second generation uh, ethnic immigrants, perhaps in Missouri third generation. But I'll show you some evidence of their presence. So let's talk a little bit about the method here in the, just very briefly, um, you know, I, I received the first uh, assignment to go into Southwestern Oklahoma in 2009, 2010. 
just to give you an idea of the scale of this work, um, this is 17 counties, 15 and a half thousand square miles. Um, I was limited, of course, to a, about a 16 week field season. I learned that the hard way. But basically you have to wait until about mid-November once the, the leaves are all off the trees um, to be able to see much of anything in uh, those areas that are wooded. And uh, then the trees leaf up again by about mid-March. Um, my budget allowed me about 30 days of travel time uh, between southwestern Oklahoma and Stillwater. Um, that meant I had to cover something like 518 square miles a day. I'm a fast driver, but not that fast. And another, another hindrance is that uh, those of you who are photographers know that it's really difficult to, to photograph buildings on a bright, clear day before about 9 a.m. at this latitude at that time of year. So I was, I was restricted to uh, you know, fairly narrow time to, uh, to photograph. Um, now, also at, this, uh, you know, at the time, uh, this, this resulted in you know, just a sample. In fact, this is, we often refer to this five-year study as a, uh, a comprehensive survey at the state of Oklahoma. It's not, it's not a comprehensive survey. It is a sample, but it's the best sample I could get. And in the first year, I was able to, to record about 366 properties. Those are, uh, that's just a proportion of those that I visited. And initially, I didn't have a clue as to do that, how to do this because we were uh, trying to digitize uh, buildings from aerial photos. And that, of course, was incredibly tedious. And it was for my research assistant, bless his heart. But the... Um, uh, you know, essentially there was no way I was going to get to all those in the amount of time that I had. So I basically had to do kind of an optimal route through the biggest clusters that we had in each county. Then in 2011, everything changed. It got much easier and, and much in more interesting in terms of method. Um, the USGS released, started releasing its historical topographic map collection and fortunately, for some, for some reason, Oklahoma was one of the very first states to be released. So I was able to download uh, files of the uh, topographic maps from the USGS that were published from about 19, the late 1930s to about, uh, well, I didn't want anything past about 1970. So um, I was able to procure maps for large portions of the counties for um, a period from about World War II till about 1960. Now, um, I, don't, I wasn't interested in anything uh, under 50 years old, but of course it really, it really didn't matter because uh, most barns aren't, most barns that I was looking for weren't gonna be constructed much after World War II anyway. So uh, I'll quickly get through how I did this, but um, the USGS now uses GeoTIFFs, which is good for everybody, but. Uh, what I would do is I'd take an old topographic map like this one, and uh, I'm going to zoom in on this part of the topo map just to give you some examples. And this is a this is a uh, a really old uh, quad uh, of uh, the area between Shawnee and Tecumseh, Oklahoma, which is east of Norman. And uh, <clears throat> um, sorry, I got a phone call there. Um, so what I did was I, I started using these uh, seven and a half minute topo maps. I was able to convert the geo PDFs to geo tests is all technical stuff, just so I could get them into ArcGIS Arc desktop. And once I got them into ArcGIS, I had access, of course, to aerial photos. So we digitized those, um, we digitized the points from the topo maps that, and, and USGS topo maps in, uh, have symbols for dwellings, which are solid black squares, and they have symbols for agricultural outbuildings, which are hollow black square, hollow squares. And that was a, that was a, that was a gold mine. So uh, what we did was we, we digitized as many data points as we could get because we didn't have coverage for the entire county. And then, um, then we ran an optical uh, optimal route, uh, uploaded them into a, a portable uh, laptop GIS and I hit the road, but let me show you an example. This is a seven and a half minute topo map. And if you look at the area around Taylor, Oklahoma, which is down in the south, south, south central, southwest area, 
Uh, I'm going to zoom in on some areas and highlight that for you. So we're going to zoom into this little square here uh, and we're going to look down and then you can see the little hamlet of Taylor. And then on the map, you can see lots of those black squares, those are dwellings. And this is, I'm not sure how old this map was, but they're all pretty much look the same um, at, at between World War II and, and 1960. And um, so you look at this map and you can see, okay, I see a few of those hollow buildings. Usually, you know, those are barns next to, next to uh, homes. And those are basically farmsteads, right? So this is in, in the cotton country of South Central Oklahoma. So here are examples here. Each one of those arrows indicates a, uh, uh, a barn on this particular part of this particular topo map in this particular county. So if you look at those, then I went through with, uh, with the GIS and aerial photos, and I just did a, what we refer to as a, a, ground, a ground truthing and to see if that thing, that, that building was still there or if there was a building still at that location. Oftentimes, of course, the building would burn or, or be wiped out by a tornado and then rebuilt. But there was no, really, what, no real way to know that from, from aerial photos, so you have to go there. So, but, but looking at aerial photos really called a lot of the targets that we had. So if you look at this, I'm gonna throw in a little aerial photo underneath that and you may not, I'm sure you can't see it on Zoom, but um, what I'm looking at, what I'm showing you here is those, uh, uh, those red targets um, or the red arrows. And gee, I can't even see it with, without my glasses, but um, yeah, the, the red arrows indicate um, existing buildings at those same locations. The yellow arrows indicate nothing. So we could throw out all the yellow, the, the points that indicate uh, targets with those yellow arrows. And then what I did was I, um, I had a, and by the way, this project, this project was um, also supported by the university, uh, Oklahoma State University and the College of Arts and Sciences, and um, particularly the motor pool. I did some damage to the motor pool, all right? And, and uh, over this, this period, I used a lot of cars, but um, and I, unfortunately, I, I, had a, I had a photo early on, I can show it to you, but um, anyway, we, we went through a lot of miles. And what I was using was um, a, a GPS navigator, my laptop, which is probably highly illegal, um, reading my laptop uh, as I'm driving, looking at those targets, and then recording my location. So this is a GPS that's talking to the laptop, telling me where I am in reference to those targets. So, this is what um, this is what helped out a, a tremendous amount, uh, and so we began to look for barns. And um, strangely, I'm just going to throw this out as, because this is a this is a, a topic of maybe another paper. Um, just in one area of southeastern Oklahoma, I've, I've shown you here. Uh, these are the this is the land area of each uh, county, Pushmataha counties. Uh, really big. Um, McCurtain County is really big. And these are the number of maps that I was able to get for those counties, which is a small portion of the total area. Um, out of those maps, I was able to pull this many targets from the old topo maps. And then look at how the, the verified targets change over time. And what I'm looking at here is that the number that were actually verified are in the order of, you know, anywhere from what, um, eight or 12 percent up to what 36 percent and <clears throat> that in itself tells you a, a great deal about the attrition of historic barns not just in Oklahoma but probably everywhere and, um, and, and then here you have num the number documented and then the number the number that we actually uh, referred to as national register eligible which is for for that southeastern area 22 overall there's around 100 barns that we identified for the National Register, which of course was the primary reason for the survey. Now let's look at log construction. Um, I'm gonna really go through this pretty quick. We've already seen the, uh, uh, the area that, I'm, that uh, is really forested and that's the Ozarks and the Washita's, but to some degree, the, the woodland uh, cross timbers is also important. But more important is the presence of the Indian territory because log construction preceded the railroads. In fact, um, 
Railroads only came around in Indian Territory. There was only one line built in 1872. That's 40 years, more than 40 years after the initial settlement. Uh, and that was only one railroad. The next railroads came in about the late 1880s up to about 1910. And then of course, after 19, after World War I, you begin to lose railroad mileage. So this is an area that was highly, uh, very, very isolated prior to the railroad. Compare it to Oklahoma uh, territory. Oklahoma territory was actually opened after railroads came through, which is really bizarre. Um, and most uh, areas were, you know, under um, preemptive settlement, a, a preemptive settlement process prior to railroads. And you know, if you're lucky, uh, you were able to attract the railroad. And Indian territory it was kind of like that, but nobody really wanted to go into ter Indian territory. Number one, because there was no private property ownership; it was all. Um, uh, tribal uh, owned. And that, of course, suppressed economic development. Um, economic development was, of course, what the railroads were looking for, uh, commercial farming. And commercial farming in Indian Territory amounted to a little bit of cotton and a lot of hay, but not much reason for a railroad. So in that way, uh, the, the inaccessibility of Indian Territory was quite a, um, um, a harbinger of law construction. So, uh, log you know the, the use of logs as a uh, as a building material, you know, makes a lot of sense when you don't have good roads and we don't have uh, you know availability of, of sawn lumber. So these are the counties that these are the counties where I uh, observed and recorded log buildings, log barns, and this is basically the same area of Indian Territory. Um, and you know, I'm sure there are log buildings here. I just didn't observe many. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about sort of the patterns that we've, we see in the Ozark Plateau, uh, as with the uh, Upland South in general, there are a lot of uh, single crib and double crib log barns. Um, these were mostly reflecting you know, subsistence farms, um, but you do see some decent uh, craftsmanship and log notching. Um, uh, typical type of single pen or, or single crib barn. Um, and the type of notching that is most common is uh, generally for substantial buildings that have survived is V notching. V notching is by far the most common one I observe, uh, and then followed by saddle notching. Uh, and there are a few half timber, or excuse me. Um, a few um, uh, half dovetails. I think maybe only one full dovetail, if I could call it that. Um, but half dovetails aren't completely, um, you know, um, completely missing. Um, so here is, uh, you know, and a lot of another thing about log buildings in, in the, you know, this part of the state or anywhere is that they are often not visible from the road. They're not. They're often not uh, known. So often because they're covered with, you know. Uh, sheet metal, more properly referred to as corrugated uh, sheet iron or something like that. Um, so that that is something that has protected some of these log barns. But I found that log building in general is tough. It survives. It survives much better than sawn lumber in many cases. Um, so here are the here are some single pin or I got to quit saying that single crib log barns. Those you uh, log folks are probably cringing now. So uh, this is up in the Ozarks. These are all from the Ozarks. And you know, I suppose I have no way of knowing exactly when these were uh, built, although I've tried, I've attempted to uh, do some dendrochronology to try to get an age on you know, these logs. Um, it's very difficult because the logs are so old and weathered that uh, the, the rings are difficult to read. And of course, you gotta, you gotta cut some logs. I don't wanna do that. Um, here's some examples of V-notching. V-notching is not real, you know, agricultural outbuildings in general are not, not going to be your, your best quality work, right? Um, and I like to think that's the case, but there's also, you know, ideas about the sort of the decline of log construction um, craftsmanship from east to west. John Reeder um, at the University of Tennessee uh, um, expressed this, that, you know, the, the ability to to construct notches, um, you know, especially water uh, draining notches that don't rot, 
uh, is maybe a skill that began to be that began waning in the later 19th century, early 20th century. And so you begin to see, uh, you know, people knowing how to do it kind of, but not very well. Um, so you begin to see that sort of thing. Um, and of course, a lot of these log barns were probably built as dwellings originally and then got demoted to, uh, to barns or chicken houses or whatever. Here's my example of what I, what I like to think of as full dovetail notching. And the only place I found full dovetail notching was in, in the Ozarks, in the Cherokee Ozarks, um, close to the old Cherokee cultural core area around Tahlequah. And uh, of course they used an ads, they, they, they um, of course um, squared up the, uh, the logs uh, and, <clears throat> and usually chinked them with, uh, with just stones and, and mud, most of the mud's gone by now. We do see a lot of uh, square notching or maybe even half notching, uh, really, you know, not really a notch at all, but um, very much prone to rot, that's what you see here. Uh, this particular location contained uh, a number of square or, or half notches, which are not sort of false notches, and um, V notches. And the V notched log uh, buildings were in great shape. And the half notch log, you know, they're falling over. Here's one that, here's a, uh, another half notch, but this one, of course, is covered with siding. So, um, and, and it's chinked with concrete or chinked with mortar. So it's probably a little better, a little more watertight, but uh, you know, water, uh, water resistance is the key to, uh, to survival uh, for log barns. In the Washita Mountains, we see uh, great, in the Washita Mountains, I found a lot more variety than I did in the Ozarks. And, and that's probably because they're more isolated. Um, not sure exactly why. This is the area that was settled by the Choctaw Nation. And it's mostly an, an oak pine forest. The, the, the forest now is mostly loblolly pine, but it's been you know, harvested numerous times and sprayed. And so it's, it's increasingly pine, but uh, originally more, it was more of a mix with stands of pine. Well, in my uneducated um, guesswork prior to doing the field work, I assumed that nobody in the right mind would use pine logs to build buildings, right? Um, man, was I wrong. In fact, um, pine logs were preferred, obviously. In fact, I think pine logs were, were preferred even the, in the Ozarks when you could find them. There aren't, aren't that many, but, but pine was by far um, preferred for log construction in the Washita Mountains. Reasons? Well, I don't think there, there's any, uh, any point in talking about, you know, hardwood versus softwood, rot, and that sort of thing. What matters is size. And uh, pine logs are, of course, straighter, uh, taller, and they allow for larger buildings. And so those larger buildings, um, you know, the larger logs are what people went for, the straighter logs, and probably a little easier to work uh, than, than oak. Here's an example of uh, a double, a double, double crib barn. Um, that contains both pine and oak. Uh, you see some pine on the, on the right side and more than likely uh, that was the first uh, crib constructed, probably as a single crib barn. And then, you know, it goes they extended out to make a, uh, a double crib or if this were a dwelling, which it very much, very possibly could have been, um, you know, we'd call it a dog trot house. So um, this, this particular, um, uh, uh, barn is still in use, but my guess is that uh, when the pine ran out, uh, they had to resort to you know, lower quality hardwoods. Here's an example of the notching um, of pine logs. One thing you do find is that uh, almost well, always pine logs will be uh, split in half. You don't do that with, with hardwoods. It would split them in half and then we basically they would create um, what is um, uh, what is essentially a saddle notch, but what looks a lot like a full dovetail notch, or maybe a half dovetail notch. But when you split the logs in half, it gives them that sort of odd look. And they split the logs in half, uh, of course, to to increase the uh, uh, the space and to uh, allow the the joinery to fit a little bit better. 
Uh, geographer Terry, Terry Jordan Bischoff uh, uh, used to refer to this as semi-lunate notching, which you know, it looks like a half moon. Um, that's you know basically the uh, it's the only notch you're going to get uh, probably with pine. So uh, just showing you so that's another view of the uh, of the saddle notched hardwood side of that crib. Sometimes we see some half um, uh, half dovetail. So in this case, you've got half dovetail. This is up in the Ozarks. Half dovetail doesn't you know it's not real impressive if you're from if you're from uh, east of the Mississippi, you're probably gagging right now. Oh, that's awful. But that's what you see. We see that um, you know out here on the on the fringe of the Great Plains, where trees are short and often knocked down by ice storms and tornadoes and burnt by fires. And so, and it, trees really don't belong here. Um, it, trees are only here since uh, the last 130 years, since uh, you know white folks moved in and uh, started suppressing fires. So. Uh, maybe someday it'll get back to normal. We did find some really cool uh, log buildings down in the southeast part of the state, and uh, including some some buildings or some types of barns that had yet been documented at all. Um, Terry Jordan had, of course, documented a few double crib or excuse me, uh, uh, four crib log barns in Texas, and uh, the the idea was that those were so incredibly rare that. Surely there weren't anywhere, uh, you know, other than what he found in Texas. And, uh, you know, I had much, much respect for the late Terry Jordan. Um, and I wish he would have, I wish he were around now to, to see this, um, that this is a four crib log barn built out of pine down in southeastern Oklahoma. And it's one of three uh, four crib log barns that, that uh, I observed and, and recorded. And this one happened to be Linda. Linda, I think, wrote the uh, Linda Ozan uh, got this uh, listed on the National Register. It's a fantastic barn um, for a four crib. Here are the cribs, and all built out of pine, still in use, uh, still on, still uh, used by the same family on the same ranch. And here's another one that's about nine or eleven miles away. Okay, moving on. Uh, Sandstone Hills, that's the area of central Oklahoma where I am basically, and, and that's where the, we find the cross timbers. Uh, this is an area uh, settled by other groups. It's basically what you see in terms of log barns and um, uh, it's, it's sort of the, the lower quality log barns, mostly out of post oak because that's about the only decent building material we had. Now, sometimes they survive really well when, as in this case, which was covered by corrugated, corrugated sheet metal. And the only way I knew that this was a log barn at this location was through those historic maps. Otherwise I would have never seen it. And the owner showed me all about it and you know, showed, showed every, everything to me. Um, you know, so anyway, you know how you learn in field work, um, lots of stores. This one's very accessible and easily, easily seen. Uh, and uh, it's, it's in the same region, same region of, uh, and here I'll, I'll show you some four crib log barns. I'm actually gonna speed up a little bit here. This is the, uh, uh, this is a four crib log barn. Let's see, actually I'll take that back. Um, I called that a four crib log barn. I'm getting way ahead of me myself, right? This was not a four crib log barn. This is a log transverse crib barn, okay? So sorry about that. Uh, Log transverse crib barns were thought probably not to exist, but here are the four crib log barns. These are the, the real gems of the, for the log construction folks. Uh, this one is located down in um, uh, near Medill and um, uh, around Lake Texoma in South Central Oklahoma. Um, it is, uh, it was also listed on the National Register. Uh, fantastic barn. It was actually removed to this area from south of the Red River in 1894, and uh, no telling how old it was before then. But it is uh, utilized by a, uh, or was utilized by a ranch for a very long time. Um, now the the notching is not that impressive. It's just half notching and, and square notching, uh, but it's a, a very tall barn. The the cribs are like 13 feet tall. Uh, for around here, that's pretty impressive. Still got a, a grain grinder up there. Okay, I'm gonna move on quickly to some coffee table book barns. Here's your typical barn. Um, I'm getting ready to do a, uh, or present a paper at uh, Southwestern uh, um, 
uh, Association of American Geographers meeting next or a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, most uh, the idea would be, or the idea of that paper is about um, uh, how Americans perceive barns. And here's your stereotypical barn that pretty much is used for every advertising label that you can think of that utilizes barns. We all know it as a, you know, it's a gambrel roof, um, um, transverse frame barn. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a, a dairy barn in this case um, with a, a hay mow door at the, at the front gable. And of course a hay hood or hay bonnet, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and even a, you know, a ridge ventilator. So these are, and typically you also see a, a silo, of course, uh, in those images. But this is a, and of course it's red, okay? Everybody knows barns to be red. So here are your, here's your stereotypical barn. And that's all I'm gonna say for now. But barns take on all different sizes and, and shapes. And of course, this is a, you know, like a, you might call it a Gothic arch roof barn, round roof barn. Uh, this is way out in, um, uh, Cimarron County, uh, actually Beaver County in, in the Panhandle. Some more building materials uh, include things like um, um, uh, terracotta load bearing wall tile that uh, you would generally see in commercial buildings in downtown areas, of, you know, small towns, whenever they knock down an old building, you always see this stuff exposed, right? Those of you architects know what it's for. But I found a lot of barns built out of this stuff, probably because it was um, you know, on surplus somewhere, but it makes quite a nice building material for, uh, for things like barns. And this of course is, you know, as we know, the, the bus barn. All right, uh, but some really impressive stuff is up in North Central Oklahoma, that area that was colonized um, by people from the Midwest, including people of perhaps German extraction from the lower Missouri Valley in, in Missouri, um, the, you know, the, uh, the wine country of Missouri. So that area, or that area um, likely uh, was the source of whoever built this um, more or less uh, Pennsylvania German ground, ground barn <clears throat> or grun shear. Uh, as I, I showed you back in 2014, this was one of this area, this area of North Central Oklahoma is uh, the area where you see the use of this, uh, this white limestone it's, it's sort of similar to what you find down in, you know, the, the area of the, the hill country of Texas. Not quite that good, but um, it's referred to as Silverdale stone uh, up here. And it's, it's been utilized for, you know, probably the better part of a century uh, for building materials. And, and this is um, a local, it's a local material. Um, it is, um, uh, it, it's sort of a, a regional um, uh, diagnostic trait. Of, of the region, and uh, it's, it's it's really beautiful. Uh, this is, of course, a um, a country um, granary, uh, grain elevator, an old time uh, grain elevator or granary. Um, takes a uh, an, an English three bay threshing barn form, and uh, this happens to be way out in Cimarron County, in the Panhandle, um, a place where you don't find uh, you don't find nearly as much wheat hardly any, in fact, uh, in Cimarron County. Uh, but this was ground zero for the Dust Bowl back in the 1930s. My, more than likely that, that uh, granary was reflecting the high times, the fat times of the 19 teens in, in World War I. So uh, everything changed, didn't it? This is what I would refer to as the uh, third most photographed barn in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, it's a, uh, of course, you know, nothing special, but it's uh, on Highway 412 near the Texas Cimarron County, uh, Texas Cimarron County line. And it's, uh, it's one of those barns that people see all the time. And of course, people passing through going to Colorado or whatever, uh, will see this and it's right, it's right at a, a small, um, uh, county road intersection with the highway. Uh, and, and so lots of people stop and take pictures of this barn. You can get on the internet, you can find this barn. Um, but of course, the reason I show you this is because uh, you'll notice that uh, if you look closely, the owner of that barn has um, taken pains to put a lot of expensive hog panels around 
entirely around that barn to keep people from messing around in it. Barns are dangerous, especially old barns, um, for a variety of reasons. Landowners, of course, don't want the liability of somebody getting hurt on their property. So they do their very best to keep them out. And so um, uh, this is one of those reasons why we have fewer and fewer barns. Barns are often torched by their owners. Uh, often, uh, in fact, I, I ran across a log barn being, um, being torn down once. Uh, and I, I, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine it, but um, you know, barns are, are often considered liabilities. This is a uh, this is a barn that was not a liability. This is a uh, a form that I uh, I like to refer to as uh, after the um, after the dwelling form um, a uh, a four square plan barn. And I have not and please if you know of any literature on four on, on a barn that is basically a square with a you know a central cupola event. Um, this happens to be a dairy barn. I found about four different examples of this, um, what I call a four square, it's a you know, two level barn. Uh, this one happened to be uh, uh, preserved by the owner and uh, it's now covered with uh, aluminum siding. Uh, other barns around the, uh, around the area uh, include just your typical transverse frame barns, uh, complete with milk, you know, uh, milk houses, that's, that sort of thing the occasional log crib barn that you'll see passing uh, around if you drive on the back roads of Southeast Oklahoma. In this part of the state, I live in, in the uh, red bed plains where the sandstone is red and the ground is red and the mud on your car is red, your car is red and really orange, it's more orange than red. Um, anyway, the, um, I'm from OSU, so I'm, it's more orange. Anyway, this, uh, you know, this sandstone is often used for uh, for construction purposes. This is a, a one of those barns that's easily visible from the interstate, so it gets a lot of traffic. Um, on the other hand, here's another one of those four square barns. This is in Tillman County, southwestern Oklahoma, far from the county seat of Frederick, the sprawling metropolis of Frederick, Oklahoma. This barn is uh, one of those things that really intrigues me. It's it's a barn that's probably been there for a hundred years. It's a, it's a dairy barn, as you might be able to tell from the traces of white paint. Dairy barns were always painted white and mostly painted white. Um, and um, this is the thing that interests me about this is that not only, you know, we have those barns that are in high traffic areas that everybody sees, but we have, uh, you know, a thousand times more barns uh, in, in places that nobody ever sees, in places that are unseen to the, the vast majority of inhabitants, even around that, that area. And even when they are seen, most people are ignorant of what they are. In this case, most people believe this to be an old school, old school house or church. At least that's what I've gathered from asking people around this area. Of course, it's a dairy barn, but you only know that after you look inside. And I'm not going to show you the, uh, the floor plans or, or guts of the building. Um, I'm only I'm trying to get through breadth today. But uh, this is one of those that nobody really understood what it was. And, and so that, that kind of fascinates me. Sandstone, um, uh, another sandstone barn, easily visible from a local turnpike here in Oklahoma. Here's one that is not very visible because it's on a ranch uh, where, um, and it's back in the, in, the, in the back part of a ranch in a uh, meander of the Arkansas River, very inaccessible area. And as you approach the ranch, there's a fence and a gate where the owner has a sign that says, if you can read this sign, you're, in, you're within range. So, um, uh, you know, um, it's, a, it's a, a beautiful old barn, but a lot of people simply don't um, you know, want to advertise them. They don't want people um, snooping around their barns, taking pictures, that sort of thing. And of course, you know, there are a lot of barns that are just in hor really horrible shape that are beyond any, you know, any ability to re uh, rehabilitate. And you know, these, are, these are hazards, not just to people, but to livestock. And so this is another reason to tear them down. On the other hand, you have gems of barns like 
the, uh, the Bar T Ranch Barn near Quapaw in Ottawa County, which is the extreme northeastern corner of the state of Oklahoma. This well-kept uh, Mississippian limestone masonry, Mississippian and, and sandstone, uh, sandstone and limestone barn, um, it was built in 1930 by a lawyer who lost his fortune in the depression, lost the barn and the ranch. Uh, and <clears throat> then it was picked up by uh, another family who still owns it. But this is a, a really, really fantastic um, uh, form that uh, is worth uh, the National Register. Another, a number of other ones uh, just in uh, around central Oklahoma, just make for a lot of beauty. This is, this is the second most photographed barn in the state of Oklahoma. It happens to be the, uh, uh, the largest freestanding barn in the state of Oklahoma. Um, I think that's a trivial, a trivial pursuit question, but it's located uh, just north of me at uh, an area known as Red Rock, Oklahoma. And this barn is not really that new and structurally it's really not that impressive. Um, it uh, was built in 1947 and burned and was rebuilt in 1951. It's basically, basically a big hay barn for a ranch. On the other hand, you have large barns that are in those areas where people very rarely see. And this is, a, um, uh, this is what I identify. And this, is, this, is, this barn is squarely in one of the four main uh, Amish areas of the state of Oklahoma. This happens to be in the old order Amish, the most conservative Amish group. Uh, in, in southwestern Oklahoma. Uh, it's, it happens to be in um, around Weatherford and Custer County, which is sort of south or sort of west central Oklahoma. Uh, the, the Amish barns in this part of the, uh, in, in Oklahoma at least, often have these pinnace roofs. And that pent, uh, pent roof or pinnace roof is very similar, similar to what I've seen in Holmes County, Ohio. The, uh, one of those, one of those uh, uh, core areas of Amish settlement. Um, so, so that's a that's kind of a diagnostic trick. Of some of these Amish barns that we see. Uh, we also see lots of um, uh, lots of what we might call adaptation of various forms. And here is a uh, this is this is the, the photograph that everybody I ever show says, "Oh, that's awesome." Um, it's what it is is a uh, of course it's a transverse crib or transverse frame form, but it is entirely a uh, a granary, and uh, you can see it's in the middle of a wheat field. This is in southwestern Oklahoma, and the uh, the use of the transverse crib form uh, as a, as a specialized granary is another example of how, at least to me. Um, and we're not going to get anywhere close to halfway through this presentation. But that's okay. Um, we're not, you know, to me, this uh, is a uh, an interesting pattern that we see in Oklahoma that the uh, the adaptation of different traditional forms of general use barns, you know, with the various uses that is house, or, you know, maybe house cattle, um, certainly to store hay, to store grain, to store tack. Um, so a multi-use barn becomes a specialized uh, barn in a, in a very, very much specialized wheat growing area. Um, so anyway, log barns, uh, okay. I'm gonna skip over this and I think we're almost about out of time. So rather than, um, and, okay, since I showed you the third and the second most photographed barn in the, uh, in the state of Oklahoma, the only one, the only barn that I never recorded was the, uh, the round barn, which is by far the most photographed barn in the state of Oklahoma. And um, if you've never visited this, it's a, it's a wonderful, fantastic round barn. We have other round barns in the state. I was able to locate um, a few of them. Uh, and uh, if you want to count octagonal barns, then I, I could say we found kind of a round barn, or at least a non-orthogonal barn. This happens to be up near, near Balco in Beaver County in the Panhandle. It's a, it's a dairy barn, uh, although it's used today for selling pigs. Uh, another round barn that was on the National Register um, uh, when I got started with this was around Salisaw in, in uh, eastern Oklahoma, extreme eastern Oklahoma. 
And it was this barn, which a colleague of mine um, gave me that she had taken, an architect uh, colleague. And uh, this was a fantastic 16-sided um, concrete wall barn, dairy barn. And um, uh, so I, I thought, okay, well, I need to go redocument it because it hasn't been, hasn't been you know, photographed since it was nominated. So uh, this is what happens. You go up to it and, well, that's what's left of it. Um, this, this, log, this very large, you know, 16, I don't know what, what that would be called, but almost a round barn, uh, was apparently utilized by vagrants and, um, uh, and it caught fire and burned. You can see some of the big, uh, big posts up there. Uh, there are other octagonal barns like uh, kill barns uh, on the campus of Oklahoma State. Uh, this is the old hog killing barn. This is also uh, you know, round barns. Are, for some reason, round barns intrigue people, but uh, this is just a, uh, it's a, a horse, um, horse barn where you have a round uh, workout uh, pen. So that's about that's about enough. We're out of time. I've got uh, maybe I, maybe I can do another presentation in a few years for y'all, uh, but I'll, I'll just keep it at that since we're out of time, and I'll be happy to answer any questions or attempt to. Oh, uh, thank you, Brad. I know as the biggest barn dork, well, I can't claim that entirely, but I I could listen all night. It is um, it is really great to see as as John um, Addison's comment to the group points out um, the wide variety that you were able. Um, to capture and document. And I will say, um, uh, being a cultural geographer, uh, my first question would be, how many of, um, of, of, your, of your variety, of your breed um, are still at this? Because uh, I know that recently, uh, actually this past March, we lost Alan Noble, of course, Terry Jordan um, uh, Bukov uh, is, is lost too. I actually went back to try and find all the authors that were appeared in the barns of the Midwest um, in that compilation and realized that a good significant number of them were cultural geographers and have um, and have passed on as well. So um, so so uh, clearly you you really dived into what Oklahoma has to offer. Are there are these types of studies still going on in your field um, across the country? Well I'm not dead yet. Thank God. Uh, and, and and but I am I am kind of a you know, I am kind of a, a dinosaur in the field of cultural geography, which, which would, uh, you know, in general, most people don't care too much about barns these days. Um, but this is one of the main reasons I got interested in my field in geography. So I'm not giving it up. They're, they're going to have to pull me away, kicking and screaming from it. Um, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be a social theory critic. I'm not uh, into that. Um, I'm much more interested in change and, and um, agricultural, you know, agricultural change and evidence of, on, the, on the landscape. Um, so I hope that answered it. But yeah, there are a few other folks. Um, and, and what I should tell you is that there is a, we have a society, it used to be called, you're probably familiar with the Pioneer America Society, right? Right. All, all of those folks that you mentioned were were founding members, I think, of the Pioneer America Society, which now goes by the handle of the International Society for Landscape, Material Culture, and something or other. I can't remember. Right. Uh, but, you know, why we changed the name, I'm not sure either. But we do meet every year. And um, in fact, next year, our meeting is going to be in Tulsa. So if any of y'all are members of that, members of that uh, organization, very much welcome to Tulsa. And uh, we're going to do a lot of good stuff there. Any other Thank questions? You. Shay, Shay Otley is there. Uh, <laughs> and, and Shay uh, was was a member of the uh, uh, works at the, the Oklahoma Shippo, and she was very much one of those people who were we were very very uh, helpful and and uh, critical to um, to the success of this survey. Allison Griner is my department head. She's a um, cultural geographer as well. And uh, she also is very supportive. My former department head, Dale Lightfoot, um, has also was the uh, department head while I was doing this uh, study. And um, he also deserves some credit. 
Well, I think, I think again, it, it points out too that you are one of the few people that I'm aware of who's continuing and, and doing these type of studies ongoing. But, um, but I know preservationists, we've relied a lot on cultural geographers and their work to document, um, to document barns in the past. And so I hope, um, I hope that work continues and I'm pleased to see you do it. Um, I was, I will say, I typed in a comment about the, um, the four square barn um, that you were bringing up because I had recorded a few in central Kentucky that were actually used for horses, mostly thoroughbreds, I guess. They, it seemed to be that the ventilation was very good in those barns because um, at least in a lot of the ones that I documented, there was actually a cross axial kind of aisle where it was actually four cribs. And I didn't know at the time, I guess I had kind of thought that maybe they were a transitional or a precursor in between that transverse frame when you actually do those, um, the, the cribs that back on each other there or tack on as opposed to those separated by that cross axial plan. But um yeah, but, that's but what, it's very that's interesting. What the theory was uh, for log barns, right? The, right, the, the right. Four square, the, the, the four crib log barns from the predecessor, the transverse crib barn, transverse crib yeah. barn, of course, became the most common one throughout the, the South. I don't know if that's true. It, it, right, you know, right. Nobody's exactly. ever going to know if that's true, but right. um, it sounds cool. But I'll shoot you a couple of those uh, a year away if that helps. Anyway. Okay, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I see Allison provided the name for us, the International Society for Landscape, Place, and Material Culture. She's, she's a member also, and at least she has a better memory than I do. <laughs> well, I do think your sampling strategy um, was, was pretty good considering the size of your state as well. I, uh, I think, uh, you know, I do think that there's different ways to try and approach it uh, when you go to try and record and understand what's out there. But um, but I was seeing from the SHPO's website uh, about the um, about the survey that in a way the, the publicity, the PR helped you identify a lot uh, uh, or a number of them that, that ended up being pretty um, rare and unique. And so um, um, that kind of hits back on the idea of what we're trying to do here at least is just to raise awareness of what's out there so that people can understand why they shouldn't torch their barn or why they should um, uh, consider at least having it recorded if nothing else so that we can we can know it was there that's a beauty this is up in northeastern oklahoma in the ozarks and i call this um this material i'm not really sure what you would call it but um i just call it a, a limestone or, or um a flint chert and limestone rubble um i'm not sure what we would call it but uh, it's <clears throat> it's all put together with mortar. I was going to show you a few other things. It's also used in you know less less fancy barns, but uh, probably my my favorite building material is located right in the Wichita's. I mentioned that earlier. I didn't get to it, but in the Wichita Mountains, you've got uh, it, it's an outcropping of of granite, and we have these granite cobblestones, and basically farmers um, you know are. I suppose we're, we're removing those cobblestones from fields and uh, found a decent use for them. So uh, we've got all kinds of uh, cobblestone barns and, and outbuildings and uh, what I would consider the, uh, the only bomb proof chicken house in the world right here. I don't know. So it's a, you know, th this is an interesting, interesting uh, building material. Um, but we've got a lot of other ones here. So anyway. No, that's Anybody great. That questions? reminds me of the, the cord woods that are. Uh, here's some, here's some more Amish, uh, barns from the Amish areas with the pent roof. All of these are in the Amish area, which is very small in Washita and Custer County, West Central Oklahoma. All right. Well, I appreciate your time and I don't want to push this over the, way over the limit, but um, if y'all uh, have any further questions or insights, I really appreciate your insights. Um, please get a hold of me at, uh, uh, well, you can Google me, bbays at oakstate.edu, uh, Brad Bays is my name, and uh, I'm, I'm, I can't really hide, so you can find me somewhere. But I appreciate you uh, uh, contacting me. Uh, if you can, if you have any insights on things like those four square barns um, or 
Oh, I'm going to nail you on log construction too. I mean, I won't say that I'm an expert, but there are certainly, um, I've, I've been retracing it a little bit more lately and I do wish Doug Reed was on this call. I will share the video with him. So no, thank you, Brad. Thanks for taking the time to come um, back on and sharing with us um, uh, again, all this wonderful detail of the hard work that you've been doing. So we really appreciate your efforts and uh, look forward to staying in touch. Thank you very much. No, 